Hello and welcome to episode 61 of the Physique Development Podcast. Today we're going to be doing something a little fun, just doing a Q&A from questions that you guys asked over on Instagram. So if you're not following us on Instagram, then... What the heck, dude? What the heck? <laughs> we'll have those linked in the show notes or if you're watching the video, I'm sure our names popped up above our heads. But let's go ahead and get rolling. Let's do it. All right, Alex. What's your biggest tell that your mental health is starting to decline? Start off on a big one. <laughs> Starting with a, a home run here. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at, at my mental health in general, some of the things that are huge tells is when was the last time I was at the barber? If I've been at the barber within the last two weeks, I'm probably good. But if it's been like three, four, five six weeks since I've been at the barber, there's some there's some things going on for me mentally that are probably not in the best spot. Then you can ask, when was the last time that you called like one of your closest friends? And if it's been within probably the last two or three days, I'm probably pretty good. But if I haven't reached out to a close friend within probably three days, I've got something going on. Um, another thing, I'm trying to think of, oh, like how consistent I've been with my training. If I've gone multiple days of like, no, I've had so much to do with work. I've had X, Y, and Z. I can make up every excuse in the book and I haven't trained in let's say you know, four days or so. At that point, that's another sign of like, eh, I probably just need to like go and do those things to allow for myself. Because those three things in general, I go get cleaned up at the barber. I call one of my closest friends. I get in and have a good training session. Like all three of those things can fix my mental health, like in a, in a turn or in a five minute span type situation where it's like yesterday, yesterday I didn't have the best day in general and work was crazy and all these different things, but I was able to call some of our closest friends and have some really good FaceTimes with them. And at the end of the day, I was like, I didn't really have a great day at work, but I got to talk to our, our friends in general. And it was like, I had a great day solely because I had those conversations with them. Yeah. I think it's interesting because like the things that I think about if I'm not doing in regards to my mental health, it's two way of sometimes not doing those cause my mental health to be worse. But it's also a tale of like, if I have so much going on that I don't, I think I don't have time to do those, then that does contribute to my mental health being worse as a whole. So it's not always just because I didn't do these things, my mental health is in a bad spot. It's more of, I know that when my mental health is in a good spot, I'm doing those things regularly. So for myself, it's when I notice that I start to skimp on like washing my face or just any kind of self-care for me as far as doing my yoga or my gratefulness list or washing my face and being very regular within my skincare and I start to just slack off with it. Um, it's also going to be something like, for example, if the boxes in our house are not broken down or just like our areas aren't cleaned up. Of course, to some degree, there's always like a aspect of your living in a home. It's not going to be perfectly clean every second of the day. But I know that it does affect my mental health if things are like day after day left in a mess, or I don't prioritize that time to just do something like breaking down the boxes or tidying up the kitchen or keeping an area clean that really affects my, my space as a whole. And then even something like washing the sheets consistently, I know that it is multi-pronged of like it helps for your allergies because the dogs will get on the bed as well as like for skincare. I know that washing our sheets more frequently really helps me with that. And it's the aspect of like the feeling of getting into clean sheets is so nice. And so it's very multifaceted as far as like these little things that I pick up on. But I think we've had a lot of good conversations about this of like knowing the things that when we do start to slip, that's when our mental health starts to slip even more as if we weren't doing those things. Or yeah, we and, and for those with a partner that they live with, this is something that you can hold the other one accountable to. Because I know that when I'm struggling myself, that Sue will bring up those three things that I just touched on. And it becomes very evident of like, yeah, I'm just not, I'm not doing the actions that I know make my mental health better. And so keeping your, your spouse or, or your partner or someone that you live with um, accountable to that is, is really helpful too. 
Yeah. Another one is walks slash getting outside. Like if we notice if we haven't been outside in a day, how we feel, even if it is frigid or raining or whatever it may be. If I have, it's kind of like the concept of don't miss twice within food of like, don't have two meals back to back that are quote unquote, not good meals. It's the same thing. If I go two days back to back of again, not doing some of those things or not getting outside, I very much so notice how it affects my my mood as a whole. So it's also great to just take inventory of what those things are for you. So you can have those mental notes of, oh my gosh, I didn't do this today. That's why I'm not feeling my best or knowing I need to do this to feel better for myself. Very important. Uh, would you rather never have coffee again or never have energy drinks again? Probably never have energy drinks again. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to be able to have coffee. I think that the process of going to get coffee mm -hmm. and trying different coffee uh, shops and, and going different locations and getting to see, you know, the coffee culture in an yeah. area almost is like a really fun experience. So if I had to pick now, I do love my Alani's. I, I do to the, to my core. I love my Alani energy drinks, but uh, I would have to go with coffee. I would easily go with coffee because I don't have energy drinks. Yeah. But there was another question of would you rather never have coffee again or never have rice cakes again, which is quite difficult. I would still choose coffee just because there's other things that supplement for rice cakes, but there's not other things for me personally that supplement for coffee because I don't drink energy drinks or have anything else of that magnitude. Yeah. And, and for me, especially for carb meals that are super dense, like 100 plus per sitting, it's nice to have a different texture of, of carb with the meal. Like if it's, if it's uh, rice and potatoes, and then just to have a little bit of crunch with that rice cake makes things all the difference, especially when you're having multiple meals that are like a hundred plus carb for individuals who have had to really push food like myself in those scenarios. It's nice to have a little bit of difference in texture for sure. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what is your favorite cardio? I would say just steps. I would say it was in like right when I started bodybuilding, it was much more athletic based because I was still in the athletic realm of things. I still wanted to sprint. I still wanted to do things more, you know, crazy, uh, ballistic, if you will. That's a strong word for what I was doing, but whatever. Um, so yeah, I would say walking on the treadmill steps in general being my favorite in, and also what I program the most for clients. Walking for sure. I could just walk all freaking day, all day long. It's the best to just go on a walk with a friend and chat. I, Mackenzie and I used to go on walks that were like two plus hours long. We would, she would drive to our house in Indiana and then we would go on this walk that was like a 45 minute walk around a pond and we would realize we weren't done talking. So then we would loop around the neighborhood, stop at the house and Alex would be like, you've been gone for a really long time. We're like, oh, we're just stopping to pee and we're going to keep walking and then leave and just keep walking until we were done talking. So walking for sure, the best cardio, the most underrated cardio too. I posted the other day of me, like a very lean video of me saying like, would you be surprised if like walking was the only cardio that I did to get this lean. Of course, there's diet considerations and there's a lot more that goes into it. But for cardio, all I did was walking and a lot of people were surprised. So yeah, I, I was surprised, though, that a lot of the people were saying that they weren't surprised, yeah. at least when at least when I clicked it, a mm -hmm. lot of people were saying that they weren't surprised. Yeah, which I was, which I was surprised. <laughs> <at> that. <laughs> it's good. It's good that walking's catching on. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I've been wanting to hire the last coach that I'll ever need, then we cannot wait to get on a phone call with you. There's going to be an inquiry link below in the description box or the show notes. We'll hop on a call, talk about the service and make sure that we get you living the life that you want to. Can a heavy leg day make the scale go up a couple pounds the next morning? It sure can. And the reason for that is because you're breaking down um, the, the muscle tissue as a whole. And so when you are doing that, they're going to push inflammation towards the area to really signal to the body of like, hey, we need nutrients for repair here. So that's a the signaling mechanism, if you will. So you're going to see that be reflective on the scale. Yeah. And a few other things within the scale, just while we're talking about it, is the scale shows one 
like snapshot of what all's going on and you have to be able to take into consideration all the variables that go into it. So if you just step on the scale and you see a number and you're like, well, that means like I didn't see success because it wasn't in the direction that I wanted it to or it wasn't the number that I wanted it to. You're doing yourself a major disservice where you could just reflect and say, oh, I ate a little bit later or I had more sodium that day or something didn't sit great in my digestion. I didn't have the greatest night of sleep. I trained later than normal or I had a very heavy training session. I had more inflammation. I was out in the heat. There's a million different things I could list here. But But if you just step on the scale and you just use that one number to decide, that's where things get into a very sticky situation. So being able to understand the scale and what all goes into it will very much so help you and your mentality towards the scale. And I think that this is something that we work with a lot of our clients on is that it's just part of all of the data collection that we're creating. And so as soon as the the client, and, and I'm kind of on the, the side here, and I'd like to hear your thoughts of if someone's having trouble with the scale, I actually want them more often than not to be on there more Mm -hmm. for them to have the data and to like understand that they're still having success within all these other metrics, no matter what that scale is doing, it's just a part of, of the entire puzzle here. It's just a piece of it. And so for them to see that number and then to also see physique photos improving, um, I find that to be a very valuable tool of just like facing the kind of the thing that's almost the fear or the thing that's causing discomfort head on and and being like, no, this is not defining my success. And I can see that I'm having success elsewhere too. Yeah, I, I will do it that way of doing like a little bit of immersion therapy or exposure therapy of like just be on it so much that you learn about it and you're able to have that disconnect. But there are different approaches, of course, to take with each client and you do have to take into consideration where they're at and truthfully like where they can get missed mentally within that time in their life because there's some clients that just and I I can tell they just can't take that number and look at it in a different way they need time away so I'll do like two different ways of completely taking the scale and be like you are not allowed to weigh yourself I do not want to see have your husband take the scale take the batteries out whatever it may be I do not want you stepping on that scale at all and they'll have a lot of stress of oh my gosh am I seeing progress because they don't have that number and that's helpful because we'll go off of pictures and biofeedback and show them hey we didn't need the number. It's just one other metric we can look at. But then I will do the opposite of having them step on it more, as well as really hearing their mindset towards the scale. So I had a client and anytime she checked in and the scale weight would be up or the same, she would always apologize to me and then explain herself. She'd be like, I'm so sorry the scale didn't drop this week. I did X, Y, and Z. I'll do better this week. And I had to like really dig in and be like, hey, what what was your past experiences with coaches with the scale and why do you keep apologizing? And she would vocalize to me that her past coach would put in a Facebook group with all of the clients and list out the people who didn't see the scale drop that week and like publicly roast them to everyone. I'm like, that sounds miserable. I can imagine why you are apologizing to me right now. But I had to be very vocal with her of, hey, I do want you on the scale because I need you to learn this lesson that one, I use it as one metric and I am not that past coach. And then reprogramming how she viewed the scale and making sure it was uber clear to her what I was expecting to see with the scale. And that's something that if you're a coach listening to it, to this, you can give your client a lot of peace of mind by saying something as simple as I'm not expecting this scale to move or um, we're not in a deficit. So I do not need to see the scale go down or, hey, the scale might pop up with this training phase to be able to mentally prepare clients who haven't had that experience in the past with either coaches or just the scale in general. So that can be really helpful and something that you can have a monumental impact on this person and how they view weight which is such a huge thing in the society by just like teaching them, having conversation and giving them those little side notes. Even today in a check-in to me, Alex said like, hey, our goal right now is to not see this scale do this. And that's helpful just to know what he's expecting, make sure I'm reaching those expectations because I as the client want to 
be the best that I can. And it helps to know that I'm doing what the coach is wanting there. So those little tidbits can be very helpful. Yeah. And I think that the coach that you were speaking to or the previous coach that your client had is just an older way of coaching as well. Like when online coaching started, people were just like, what was your weight? What was your food? Where's your cardio? And then if if the, I mean, the only metric that they were tracking was the weight. So if the weight didn't move, it's like, well, then just less food. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, it's just not a, a good way. And I think that that practice has gone by the wayside, at least in the, the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. And people have been doing a much better job of like understanding all the variables. So um, I'm I'm excited for where, uh, coaching is, is headed. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Well, this goes right in line. But how patient should I be with scale weight before adjusting macros? This is a great question. And I am going to pass it over to Alex here in a second. But one thing to ask yourself is how consistent have you been with those macros in regards to how patient you need to be before you change them? Because if you haven't been checking the boxes, then It's not something that you need to rush to moving food immediately, as well as if you've looked at the full picture. So actually, at the beginning of my prep, uh, it was something that the scale didn't move down in the way that I thought it was going to. And it was mentally difficult for me because I was like, I'm in prep, food is lower, the scale should be going down. But I was able and we were able to look at pictures, we were able to see my physique getting leaner, and I knew I was nailing down, getting good quality sleep. I was managing stress. I had good food choices. I was training appropriately. I knew all the other variables were nailed down. So it was a lot easier for me to have patience with the scale because I saw it in other aspects. And again, I knew I was doing what I needed to do. So I have a hard time answering this question of just being like this many weeks because there's so many variables that go into it. So really being able to take a look and say, all right, If I feel like I'm plateauing, which that's a strong word to use, can I look at how is my sleep? How is my digestion? Am I on my menstrual cycle? How accurate am I with macros? How consistent am I with macros? How is my food sourcing going? How is my training? Am I training too much, too little? What does cardio look like? All of these go into that to determine if someone could answer that. So if you get irritated that a coach or you ask this question on an IG question box and someone says, it depends, it's because of all of these factors of, I could give you a blatant answer of, hey, if you are naming nailing down everything, pictures aren't changing, measurements aren't changing, nothing is changing, then here's the amount of weeks you should go. But oftentimes that's not the full picture. And we answer, it depends, to give you that full picture so you can see that context instead of just taking something cut and dry because it's not always cut and dry in this world. I'm not exactly sure what you expected me to add to that, but... <laughs> well, I talked a little bit more than I originally <laughs> planned. Just, it I, went, it's to, flowing. To give you guys a, a more, I guess, tangible takeaway to it as well is that um, one thing that we really push for our clients when they depart from working with us is that uh, I encourage them to utilize the check-in document that we provide when they're checking with us. I encourage them to still take physique photos because this is going to be, um, it's important to stay accountable to their to themselves throughout the process, especially if they're going to be going into dieting phases and those different factors as time goes on. Because you can, I, I think that one of the things that many people run into from just a lifestyle standpoint when they put themselves into a dieting phase is that they're not really tracking. They're, they're, they're not tracking all the variables that are there, they're kind of like, uh, I'm, I'm dieting, but like this happened and I've got this happening and, and I'm kind of uh, doing it, but I'm not doing it. And I'm also not taking pictures and I'm kind of weighing in like three days a week. Whereas when you're doing it yourself, your ability to, um, to look at photos and, and be able to, what's the word I'm looking be for? Objective. Be objective. Um, is, is very low. And so the more data that you can collect is going to be a very important piece. So utilizing the check-in document, utilizing your, your weight tracker, your measurements, those different things, I would say if you're having 90 plus percent adherence within your biofeedback, within your sleep, your stress, um, your, your steps, getting all of your training sessions in and really putting an effort into your training, not just 
just half-assing sessions and being like, yeah, I'm working out. I want you really training and, and putting yourself into um, a challenge and causing your body to adapt and those different factors. I would say that every 14 to 21 days, if you're having 90% plus adherence on those factors that I spoke to, I would say that'd be a time that you would potentially want to make an adjustment to the calories if you're not seeing the progressions that you want to see. And let's say that you go, uh, let's say you do 14 to 21 days, you make a drop and you continue to have 90% plus adherence and you go another 14 to 21 days and you're still not seeing the response. Now it's time to potentially take a step back. I would talk to maybe a friend or a, a previous coach of like, hey, I'm having this happen. This is all the data that I've collected and I'm not seeing the response. Do you have anything that you would suggest or anything of that nature, potentially paying for like a one-time consultation or anything at all to get a little bit of greater guidance from an outside eye? Because if you're still wanting to take this on yourself and learn about you, you may just need a little bit of an adjustment from an outside eye that's being a little bit more objective than you to be able to make the adjustments that are necessary to get to that wherever you're trying to be. And so I think that would be kind of the most tangible way to answer that question. Yeah. I love that you brought all of that up. First, I will say that if you are interested in a one-time consultation or mentorship in general, those are things that we do offer through PD. So we will have information in the description box or in the show notes if you're watching or listening to this, just in case you are interested. But I love that you brought up telling clients to still use the check-in sheet because I always tell clients that. I'm like, when you depart, you have to realize that you have tracked so many metrics and so much data and had all of that information to share with me and for me to make decisions off of that. If you go from having a coach, having all of this accountability and having all of these metrics tracked to then tracking none of that, how can you expect that transition to be smooth or for you to see the results that you want to? I don't have you fill out a check-in sheet for shits and giggles. I have you fill it in because I need those data points to make decisions based off of what's going on. And so using that sheet to your advantage, because like that's what I would do in the times that I've coached myself, I have used the check-in sheet and used data because there was a time, I think it was in 2019 possibly that I coached myself through a diet for like it was 20 weeks as far as like dieting and reversing and I coached myself and at first I just kind of started a little bit more haphazard I set my macros and like hit them but then I wasn't tracking my metrics and I was like oh when should I change this and this and I was like Sue you silly girl you silly goose why don't you look at the things that you would fill out for a coach and use that as your data to make those decisions forward so that is something that it is extremely hard Hard as a human being to try and take all of those variables and metrics and somehow like memorize them and know them all without writing them down or tracking them. So using those is going to be extremely helpful for you. And exactly like Alex said, if you ask for help, you have that data because there was a time that I went to a doctor for something and I didn't have data and they were asking me questions and I really couldn't answer. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was not helpful to them at all. And I didn't get any help in return because I didn't have that. And then the next time I went to a doctor with a problem, I had like specific dates, everything outlined in notes, and they were able to help me right away because I had that information. So yeah. And if you're taking yourself through a dieting phase, you have to track metrics because if you're just being like, no, I can, I'm doing it all in my head. I'm tracking <laughs> all of my things in my head. The reality is, is that you're making almost all the decisions from an emotional perspective and you're only taking into account probably what happened over the last 12 hours. You're not taking into account, I, I, I promise you, like I think that there are people out there that do an in incredible job coaching themselves, but those individuals do a, an immaculate job of tracking a crazy amount of data. So that is gonna be the biggest thing. Yeah. All right, what is your favorite cheesecake girl item slash flavor? Oh my gosh, um, favorite cheesecake girl, the cinnamon roll is my, of the slice. The the, the slice. slices, yeah. So the cinnamon roll, I mean, that's my favorite. We had uh, one at our wedding that was a, a glazed donut. Krispy Kreme donut. I didn't that's know if we were able so to say Krispy Kreme good. or they were going to sue Cheesecake Girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. It was great. <laughs> yeah. The, the Krispy Kreme glazed donut was so good. That's, oh, we haven't had that one in forever. The, uh, the red so. velvet is fire. 
I'm just going to keep rattling on you. Let me keep going. The Buckeye is fantastic <laughs> yeah. of the minis. Those were all ones we had at our wedding. Our, we had a double stacked cheesecake and one was glazed donut and one was red velvet. Then we had um, little mason jars for everyone else. And we had Buckeye, white chocolate raspberry. That one's really good. And then we also had Buckeye, white chocolate raspberry and something else. I've never had anything that wasn't good. Yeah, like, that's, that's the true. reality <laughs> of things is that I've every single piece that she's made i'm like yep fire yep fire only things that i haven't liked are like things that i know going in like, like yeah. i don't like that thing yeah. anyway like yeah. it's if someone were to be like i don't like fruit and chocolate and then have like a chocolate strawberry and be like i don't like that yeah. or that was bad and it's like well you knew you weren't gonna like it yeah but i agree i really haven't had anything i don't like um i love all of the donut flavor ones so she also does like a cake blueberry donut one that is so good i love cake donuts um i love the minis because they're so easy to just like pop in and have your little sweet treat and we'll stop by her location here in ohio and like she'll surprise us with like what flavor she has where i'm like i haven't seen this one before this is so cool and it'll be so good um and then she has these sandwiches oh they're so good if you grew up eating little debbie in general. First. Who didn't grow up yeah, eating that's the, the real little question. Debbie oatmeal? Oatmeal cream pie specifically. I guess I'll, this isn't on the list, but I'm going to ask this question. Comment below if you're watching this on YouTube, what little Debbie treat was yours growing up? Because Alex and I have had this conversation. For me growing up, it was oatmeal cream pies star crunch and uh the swiss cake rolls were like the main three that we had and on an off occasion we would get the cosmic brownies or we would get like the nutter bars nutter butters. nutter butters yeah yeah mine were the oatmeal cream pies zebra cakes and the nutter butters those were the three and my i think they're called nutty bars or something i think it's nutter butters okay um anyway i would be the um <laughs> i would take my like a box of them down and go down to play playstation and just inhale an entire box of zebra cakes Still does that. <laughs> no, no no i i do not have the metabolic rate to do that <laughs> any longer i do not have the level of physical activity i once did um but yeah i used to do that yeah, but she has oatmeal cream pie sandwiches, so and, they're filled. And the zebra cake. She's done a zebra cake Yeah, one. I was about to get to oh. that. She has them filled with cheesecake, and then from the oatmeal cookies, and she makes the cookies from scratch, she also has like a red velvet one, a buckeye one, a like funfetti one, all different flavors. And then she does throwback Thursdays, like one Thursday of every month, and the, she'll do like making her own zebra cake, but it's like filled with cheesecake and everything. it's so great. And then she also has filled Buckeyes, which are really good. <laughs> and She's, these tins. Sue's uh, cutting a massive promo here for, they, for It's Sam. just all <laughs> so good. I cannot, that's the thing is, and I was talking about this with Katie the other day with Story, is that I feel like people don't take me seriously of how good the product is because they know I'm friends with Katie. And I'm like, listen, I'm not blowing smoke. I got rid of so much of my other active wear because this is it. And it's so easy to promo someone when they're just good at what they do. Like it would be a different story if I have to be like, she's my sister, I have to say it's good, but it's just like good in general. And then she's my sister on top of it, which is even better. So if you are not local to Ohio, she does have three locations in central Ohio. But if you're not local, she is on Gold Belly. I will cut this promo. She is on Gold Belly, and you can search the Cheesecake Girl, and she ships nationwide. So thank me later, and then tag me when you get it. I need to know how much you loved it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are some goals you'd like to accomplish by the end of the year? Oh, man. Um Right now, I'm like painfully focused on the competition season. So it's super hard for me to even think towards the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It's like right now, I'm just wanting to have competitors be immensely successful every time they get on stage and having them look their absolute best. And it's it's a time of the year that I'm just like painfully in the trenches. And my mom kind of jokes about this of just like, I when I have goals going on or things that are very important to me, um, I get just 
lasered in and I can't even really think about anything else. And I'm in one of those phases right now. And I absolutely, I love being in this phase. Yeah. And there's, there's like negatives to it because mm -hmm. I can get like <laughs> way too hyper fixated on things. But at the same time, it's, it's something where I like relish in these moments because I just love, I, I love the, the sport of bodybuilding as a whole, but I also love just the, like getting someone to accomplish the goal that they've put so much work into and like being able to facilitate the protocol to get there and allow for them to like have that come to fruition is one of the most like fulfilling things that I've had the opportunity to do. And I think that that's what, there's so many things I love about my job in general, but that's one of the things that I'm just like, I, I look forward to it every single year. And you're just like working towards it on a day-to-day -day basis with each of the athletes. And it's such a fun experience. But, um, to answer the question by the end of the year, um, for physique development just to be thriving there's a lot of goals within physique development that we we have in place and um we've really put ourselves out there i think this year is a big thing where in in years past and we talked about this on previous episodes of just kind of like just working hard but also not wanting to put ourselves out there in the potential of it not going well or uh people you know saying something negative about us or something along those lines and so like i feel like i'm accomplishing a lot right now just because i'm i'm willing to put myself out there and take the opportunities to like fall on my face and then get back up and continue to to do to do better and those things so um yeah and and just go on a vacation with you yeah. that's a big thing <laughs> go on vacation that. um travel to see our friends like those are I think that a lot of it is like personal stuff yeah uh, because I feel so laser focused from a work perspective and I think that things are coming together um, on that front that I want to be able to take a vacation with you where we're no work a week of just like us completely disconnected Bless. and then uh, going to see friends yeah um, I would say a lot of things have already like been accomplished slash are in the process of being accomplished. I don't have like nothing springs straight to mind. I would need to like sit and think about this, but we didn't the look at these questions <laughs> yeah. before. So we're just going off the cuff, which was fun, is fun as a whole. But I would say one thing that came to mind that I would really like, and I hate that I'm saying like before the end of the year, but my office to be finished as far as like hanging stuff up and getting all of it done because it's just kind of, it looks very temporary right now. And I would really like to have that finished and have some things up on our walls in our home. Would you Would you believe me if I said we're four months away from having lived here for a year? No. That Isn't that crazy? That back. We have nothing hung up. You see, you see these pictures here. We, this <laughs> is more than we've hung up in the entire house between these seven, seven picture frames. Oh, this gosh. is more than we put up in the entire remainder of the house. My office downstairs and Sue's, I have a pile of things that are supposed to be hung up that I've looked at and been like, you know what? Not today. <laughs> and then the next day comes, I'm like, not today I'd either. like to have mirrors in <laughs> So oh, no and one still no anymore. mirrors in the bathroom. If you guys have watched the vlog, I don't know what episode that is. I think it was 003. I think it was just yours. watch them all. There's only like four or five right now. So just go through all of them so yes. to find it. <laughs> <laughs> if you go on the YouTube channel and then you go to playlists, then there's one for vlogs. So if you don't want to search through like all of the shorts and videos and everything, then that's where you can go and look. It is summertime. And with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. Um, what supplements do you take slash recommend for women trying to grow muscle? Great question. So within this one, I think that this is a very, very important thing to drive home is that most women and, and most men as well are really just needing to eat in a caloric surplus for an extended period of time. And an extended period of time is not three months. It's not six months. It's not nine months. It could be two years. You need to eat in a caloric surplus and train really hard. And I mean, really train and progress your lifts and get better at the execution of your lifts and all these different factors. Those two things alone and prioritizing your sleep are all going to be much more beneficial than any supplement that you would be taking um, within the achieving the muscle growth that you're wanting to create. And uh, that's uh, too much work. Though. <laughs> it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. And I know that a lot of you from a competitor standpoint, see these pros at the top level and they're ending their season in the middle of the year. 
And then they've got the Olympia at the end of the year. And then you see them posting of like three months off season, like three month improvement season. I'm Jack. Now I've put on like three inches to my glutes. It's that's not a thing. And, 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 and even then, if it was a thing, they're on a different level than you are at the amateur level. That I mean, that's their whole life. That's every aspect, not to say it's their whole life and they don't have anything else going on, but it's the fact of like, that's their number one priority. So if you listen to two podcasts ago, which is us recapping my first show of the season and how that all went, it comes from the fact of like, when we look at priorities and Alex and I were talking about this last night, actually, of if you're not doing absolutely everything, you can't expect to have those same results. So I know that people that are complaining about not building muscle are definitely not taking the gym and training and recovery as seriously and as consistent and diligently as those Olympians. By 0% chance are any of those people that are complaining about muscle having that diligence to their fitness. And it's okay if you don't have that diligence. By no means am I saying that if you don't have that diligence, you're not fit, you're not into fitness, you're not as important as those people. It's just saying you have to understand where priorities are and what you're putting into it in order to get out of it. Right. And the what brought it up last night is that I was telling Sue that when I get upset that maybe I'm having like a breakout or something along those lines on like my skin, I, I see how good she does a, a job of, of taking care of her skin and the work that she puts in and the frequency of just like all the things that she applies and those different <laughs> factors. She does such a good job. And so then I'm like, okay, I love how her skin looks and I'd love for my skin to look that way, but am I putting in the same effort and uh, doing the same amount of things to make my skin look that way? No. So then I'm like, I'm not that upset. It's just like, I, I know what I need to do and I'm not doing it. Thus, I can't really be upset. Yeah. And then you also talked about it within like training and food as well yeah. of like, I've been very, very on top of my food and training. Obviously I'm in prep, but just in general, I do have that work ethic of the this past six years, I've been extremely diligent within food and within and training. And I even had to have a conversation like mentally to prepare myself of since this is likely my last season competing, I have to realize I'm likely not going to have the exact same diligence and focus as I have the past six years. And therefore, I cannot expect the same results to follow moving forward because I'm not putting in that effort to match that expectation, which is something we talk about a lot with clients as well. And then we have conversations of it, of what it looks like for what your expectation is versus what effort you're putting in. And if you've put it down on paper and you might need to see, oh, I either need to raise my freaking effort, which is probably the answer, or I need to lower my expectations of what's going to happen due to the effort that I'm putting into this. So I can't expect my TikTok to grow to a bajillion followers if I'm not putting any effort into it. So I either need to change my expectation of what I want to happen or what I expect to happen versus, or I need to change what effort I'm putting in for that to happen as a result. Yeah. And the aspect of wishing for like Sue using the TikTok, like that is a very comfortable thought of like, well, you know, one thing's going to happen and I'm going to post something that's viral and then my page is going to be massive and everyone's going to trust me. And it's like not a big deal. And it's like super, like you can just lean back and say that. And the uncomfortable thing is like putting in effort and, and making posts and like posts not going well and then posts doing well and like trying to get yourself out there and like all those different things. That's the uncomfortable part. And people want to run away from what's uncomfortable. It's, it's human nature. Nature. But as you have more things in your life that you present in an uncomfortable way and you trudge through that uncomfortable level and those different aspects and you see the result that comes out of it, then all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, a light bulb goes off. And now you're in a position where it's like, I am seeking to just chronically be uncomfortable because I understand the growth that comes with it. No matter the adversity that I start with, I'm going to work through the adversity and get to a, a greater place, or I'm going to get to the next level, whatever that may be. And that's the, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. And that's hard. I mean, that's, that's hard. very hard. And we struggle with that. Again, I said it in the last episode, but like we're not coming from a place of we have it all figured out or we do it all perfectly. We most definitely do not. 
we're human beings, but we are constantly trying to learn and evolve and have conversations to reflect on where we can be better and where we can look at, hey, am I pushing into my comfort zone? Because that conversation last night stemmed into where our comfort zones are and like what we need to do to get to where we want to by putting in that effort. Like we still have to have those conversations with each other of saying, oh, I'm not in this place yet. Well, have you pushed out of your comfort zone recently? Have you applied stress in that situation? Have you put yourself in a harder situation? Have you gotten more reps in? Because with him talking about skincare, I was like, oh, that's so funny because I'm the same way within programming. If I view like, and people's, perception of how they view intelligence is all different. But intelligence, like brute intelligence, Alex has a shit ton of it. And I view that as so much more successful than a lot of the other skills I have, even though that's something where each skill is measured on a different playing field, all of that. But I was always down on myself if I'm not as good as programming of Alex and I'm not X, Y, and Z. And I was like, oh my gosh, he writes training programs all the time. He spends all the free time he can studying and learning more about the human body and doing X, Y, and Z to improve on that thing. Like, how can I expect me to be on the same level by not putting in the same amount of time or effort? Thank you. <laughs> Not to say that I don't put yeah, in yeah, effort, yeah. but again, I, my skill set is at. stretched into a different direction for what the needs are for PD. I want to make that clear. It's not, please, clients know I put a lot of effort <laughs> into it. It's just talking about those different levels. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that led us last night into a conversation speaking to um, being reflective of the different levels that you were at previously and realizing that all the time you're in this state of like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm trying to figure it out. And so you're just chronically in that state, especially as you're trying to progress. And, and it's an easy analogy within physique development where we're, we're trying to grow the business as a whole. And so it's in a, a chronic state of like, we are just every day waking up and figuring it out. We're, we're, put, we're throwing things against the wall. We're doing what we feel is, is best and seeing what works and what doesn't work and then taking that data and then adjusting. And that's, that's life in general. But it's funny because last night we were like uh, talking about going back to when it was just like very simple. Mm -hmm. it's very, it was just coaching. It was just um, working with, with clients one-on-one -on -one, and it was much, much smaller. And it was something where it's like oh, going back to that seems so relaxing. And it, the reality is, is that at that time, I felt the same way that I do now of like, I'm just trying to figure this thing out. I'm trying to keep the boat floating and trying to figure out what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And But when you're reflecting, it's like, oh, that was easy. Like that that stage of life, so easy. Can't even, can't even fathom how easy that was, I, you know? And so um, that's something important of like, it wasn't as easy as you're making it out to be, you know, almost 10 years later. Like yeah. at the time, it was probably <laughs> just as difficult as this level in, in life is as well. And we're even like re- reflecting and reimagining that because again within our staff of looking at where some of the coaches are and there where we were multiple years ago and to me sometimes I'm like oh it's so easy just do this and then I'm like Sue it wasn't easy when you were in it it was hard and even if you were doing all of the things it still took time and I have to remember that not only as a boss but also as someone who wants them to progress of I need to see what steps to help them with and how to show them what this looks like as they move forward instead of just telling them it's easy because that's not helpful to hear right. of like, hey, that's easy. Just get past it. It's like, no, it's not. Yeah. There is a process of it. Yeah, there's been a lot of places of growth this year, but the level of empathy and patience that we've been able to build, I think, has been the... Um, probably the strongest. Yeah. Like that I mean that instance in 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 and of itself has been one of the biggest like learning lessons for us. Yeah. Yeah. I very much so agree. Well, this will be our last question. Um, and I got asked this yesterday from a girl named Emily. So she had asked when I was talking about the steps, she said, do you mind if I ask how many steps you have per day? I'm worried about future fat loss as I am not being 
active as I was last diet phase, different job. Um, would love if you guys were to touch on this in a podcast. And so I asked a few more questions and she said, I used to get 15K steps easy peasy because I rode horses for a living. Now I sit mostly at a desk because I'm back at school and I was working full-time job and nursing school. So getting 8K steps was a real challenge. I went since quit my job and switched to a different job. So I'm aiming for 10K steps, which includes cardio and trying to navigate through that. So I'm not sure how that's going to affect different fat loss. So obviously that's a lot to unpack, but what we're going to talk about is the big brick of that, of what it looks like when your activity changes and how that changes as you go into a dieting phase um, and how that's going to be different in your life. Did you, are you going to answer it? Yeah, but I felt like I just <laughs> talked for a really long time. So then I was like, I should probably she, pause. She has this question that she's been holding on to and that she's ready to answer. And then she looks over and she's like, so what you got? <laughs> like, well, just I, like, the I felt like I was talking too long. <laughs> All right. What? Uh, so from that, I actually thought when she was first asking it before I asked for more information of what she was going to do if she was more active than she was previously. So if you went from a sedentary job to a more active job, that can be pretty difficult because now you have to be more activity to facilitate that same fat loss, so to speak. So it is something if someone's extremely sedentary and then they are um, moving to like getting more steps in, then that's a pretty easy exchange of you get to, hey, either eat more food or do less cardio because you're more active in this way. But for her of going to being very active to being more sedentary, this is something of being able to recognize that your body is in a different place. And if you've had time in the sedentary job and now you're going into a dieting phase, then it should be pretty easy, so to speak, to undulate your steps just based off of where your base line is from where you're starting. Yes, using past diets or past data can be helpful, but it's important to recognize when that data isn't going to apply directly to give you that correlation. So for her example of I was extremely active within riding horses, um, and that was last year versus she's already changed jobs and she's had a time period at this job, she probably already knows what her baseline of food is and her baseline of and at of activity is. So as she goes into a deficit, it's undulating that based on what that new baseline is instead of looking at old data and saying, well, last time I dieted, I had to get this many steps or I had to eat this much food when your situation is completely different. Yeah. I mean, the old data is just not value, like valuable at that point. You just got to um, assess where things are at, where things are from a hunger level standpoint as as well as uh, like soreness from the activity and those different factors, especially if she's going to be walking more on a treadmill, it sounded like. Mm -hmm. So within that, you're going to have a little bit of different impact on the joints and those different factors to, to be mindful of. Um, and then also energy levels could be different just because an individual who is going to be out in, in activity and those different factors is going to feel a lot different than the individual who's in a cubicle all day, for instance, and sitting at a desk, staring at a screen all day, rather than the person who's getting up and I mean, riding horses would be quite the adrenaline rush for me because um, one, I've never done that. And that seems like that seems serious. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like some work. So I think that, uh, you know, those factors play a role, but it, it don't overcomplicate it. It's just a matter of collecting data, assessing, and then making adjustments from there. Well, I think a good example as well is when you did your first prep, you were eating so much food because you were doing like 17 jobs and running around and doing cardio all day. And if he were to use that data for any kind of diet now, that would be null and void because he's a lot more sedentary now. And so you have to be able to look at how that applies and it doesn't apply. So now he has to use his new baseline for how active he is and use that to undulate up or down. Right. Yeah. I, I, you've got to, when you're looking at data itself, it's going to be something that is probably more relative. You, like the, the lifestyle aspects have to match. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. So if you have questions like this, as you could tell, that was a much longer question than some of the other ones, because those ones were in a question box, then I am going to leave a new um, form in the show notes or in the description box, because I think that those would be some really great episodes and that you guys would take a lot away from that, of being able to like openly dissect a situation 
section. Now, we're not doing free coaching within this, but of a longer question that we can kind of dive into and dissect. So if you have that, then I'll have something linked below that you can submit and so that we can hopefully help you in giving you that information or feedback that you need think it would be fun. You let me know. And let us know if you liked this style of podcast. We are asking for feedback consistently from you guys because we want to continue to improve. That's another thing that when we talk about to get better at something, it takes reps, it takes trying, but it also takes getting feedback and gathering feedback and being able to take those next steps forward. So any and all feedback is so welcomed. If you follow me on Instagram, I often post about the podcast and then put a question box for any feedback that you have. So that's a very easy way for you to submit without having to jump through a bunch of hoops um, and just being able to give us direct feedback of how we're doing, how we can improve, and how we can continue to help you um, because we really do love this platform and we love it even more when you guys are loving the content uh, that's coming along with it. So if you like this, then ask more questions and we will answer them. Um, but thank you guys so much for joining us on episode 61. I mean, we're getting closer and closer to 100. We're, <laughs> we're basically there. We're we got like 39, 39 more episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's crank them all out today. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining and we'll catch you in the next episode.